repentance, it means to change your mind. That's what the word means in Greek. You change your mind about something. In this case, about sin. Something that you thought was not so bad. Suddenly you realize, oh, this is bad. Repentance is also used in the Bible times. It was a normal word. If you had a man that was walking down a road like he was going on the way to Jericho, and he kind of got up on the wrong way, and so he stopped and asked someone, is this the road to Jericho? Mm -hmm. And they said, no, this is not the road to Jericho. You've got to turn around and go back where you came from. Repentance means you turn around. You see, my love, beloved, many people think repentance means, oh, I feel bad. I made a mistake. Repentance is, you should feel bad. But repentance is not, I'm sorry I sinned. Repentance is, you stop. If you just feel bad you, and you keep going with your sin, you have not repented. Mm -hmm. And if you still think the same about sin as you did before God showed you the sin, you haven't repented and you will keep doing it. When we realize, let's say, um, lying. Most everyone lies. Most people don't find anything wrong with lies. God says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not lie. Mm -hmm. So a person who has been living a lifestyle of lies and manipulation, suddenly they read God's word, the Spirit of God convicts them of sin, and they realize, oh, this is not good. And they change the way they think about sin. They change the way they think about sin. And when you change the way you think about something, it changes your feelings. Yes. If there is sin that God has showed you in your life that is sin in his word, this is the basis, the word of God. He showed you it's sin, and you stopped, and you go, no, I shouldn't really do that, but... I really want to. I really would do it if I thought nobody would know. I really would do this sin and keep on sinning if God wouldn't get me for it. I would really continue. You haven't repented. The only reason you don't have sex outside of marriage is because you're afraid of what will happen. You haven't repented. Because once we have seen what God's word says is sin, once our mind has changed about it, once our opinion has changed about it, our feelings will change, and then we don't want it. When we're still tempted. We're going to be tempted our whole lives in different areas. That's part of being human. But when we're tempted, we still we say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And the more we know God, and the more we love God, the more we hate sin. How do you feel about lying? I hate lying lies. I hate them with a passion. Why? Because I love truth. I love God's word. The more you love truth, the more you will hate wrong teachings, you will hate lying. The more you love God in his holiness, the more you will hate unholiness. The more you see Christ in all his wonderful, how wonderful he is, the more you will hate anything and not want anything that hurts him. Because he went to the cross for our sins. And when we love him, we don't just say, well, okay, I'm just a weak human. We say, I love him. And I hate that thing that I'm fighting with. I hate this thing that keeps testing me. I hate this thing that keeps trying to pull me away from him. I hate it because I love him, if you do. And Saul was the king of Israel, the first king. And God gave him a job to do. He said, I want you to go, and I want you to destroy the Amalekites. They were enemies of God. I'll talk more about that next week, why he said that. They were enemies of God. Saul wasn't just doing war. He had a command from God to kill the Amalekites, to kill everything about them. That is... You know, when we read this whole chapter, it says he says, kill the sinners. They worshipped false gods. They were, had idolatry. 
they lived in sexual sin. They were evil people. They rebuked, rejected God. And God didn't just tell Saul, I, and he, he, okay, I'll say more next week. But it was God's judgment. And it wasn't just, well, let's just, I want you to judge the people and kill the people. He said, no, their sin is so bad, I want everything gone. Everything, all their positions, all their things they have. They are so sinful, I want to destroy everything that even smells like them, that they have. Because God's holy. And what did Saul do? He didn't. But he left the king alive. Now, in a war, the very first person you want to get and you want to kill is the king. Because he's the leader, and that's the victory. They left him alive, Agog, Saul did. And the people, and they left the best of the sheep alive. And they made the excuse, well, we'll just give them for an offering to God. But did God tell them to take the best of the sheep and the animals and save them for an offering to him to worship him? That's not what God told them. God said, kill it all. My judgment. When God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed everything because their sin of perversion was so serious. He destroyed their houses. That fire, that brimstone destroyed every animal, every dog, every cat, every mouse, every person that lived in that town. God sees sin seriously. We don't because we're human beings and we're, we've grown up with sin. But he sees it seriously. And he took Saul's sin very seriously. He told Saul, after Saul was disobedient, he said, you're not going to be king anymore. You did not obey what I said to do. I want to look at verse... Um, Chapter 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. Next week I want to say more about this chapter. Because there's so much here. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23. So Samuel comes. Saul says, oh, I did what God told me to do. And Samuel says, well, how come I hear the sheep and the goats? <laughs> Oh, well, the people kept them alive. And Samuel said, God told you to kill everything. And then verse 22. Here's what Samuel said. Samuel was a prophet. He was speaking the word of God to them, to Saul. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken or to listen than the fat of rams. He's saying, God doesn't want your good works. He wants your heart. He wants your obedience. So many times, even Christians will, they'll tolerate sin in their life. And I'm talking about where you know it's wrong. You know it's in God's word. And you say, well, I'm just weak. Well, my mother, my dad, or whatever. He says, I don't want your offerings. So many times people think, well, okay, I know there's sin in my life that, that I'm just holding on to. I like this. It's my little pet. But I'll go to church, I'll give money, I'll sing and praise God and pray louder than everybody else. I'll help the old ladies. He says, I don't want that if you're being disobedient. I don't want your offerings. In one place it said in the Bible, you said, he told the folk, people of Israel, your offerings stink. I can't stand to smell your sacrifices because you're in idolatry. They were rebelling against God. God, he says, it's most important to God is that we obey his voice. Well, I don't hear God. This is his voice, God's word. He's not talking about a prophet giving you a word. He's talking about the word of God. He's not talking about, well, I have the feeling God told me something. Check it with the word of God. He says, I want you to obey my voice. 
And in the Bible, when you talk, when the, in the, especially in the Old Testament, also the New, the thought of obeying God, of hearing God. Hearing God is the same as obeying Him. I gave the example with the kids, with children. If you have children and they're, and they're um, running around and drawing on the walls with crayons, and you say, stop! And they keep drawing on the wall with a crayon. They heard you, but did they really hear you? You say, listen to me, stop. Until they stop, they haven't heard. And just because we read something that God says, this is not right. If we keep on, we haven't heard. And he says, I want you to hear. I want you to do what I say. Don't come with your good works and your holy, holy outward holiness. I want you to obey he's a good father. He's a good God. All, what if his commands is bad? What has God said that we're supposed to do that is bad? Do not kill. Is that bad? Do not commit adultery. Is that bad? There's nothing. <laughs> it's all for our good. It's all for life. And most of all, beloved, what did God want from Saul and Israel? He wanted fellowship. He wanted relationship. And sin is what stops us from that close relationship with God. God wanted Saul to love him, to bring his people, the people of Israel to love him, to honor him. It's not about just obeying. It's about having a relationship with God. That's what God wants. That's why Jesus died for our sins. Because the sin keeps us from that relationship. And he said... It's better to obey, verse 22, um, obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. Verse 23 is a really heavy verse. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. The Hebrew word, a, Greek schol a Hebrew scholar, Delich, said this passage, we have it in our Bibles, to make it maybe more understandable, where it says, for rebellion is as the sin, but in the original language, it says rebellion. I want you to hear this. It says rebellion is witchcraft. Now, our dear friends from Africa, you know a whole lot more about witchcraft than we do here in the West. And he says rebellion. When we rebellion is willful disobedience to God. He says that's witchcraft. Witchcraft is you're wanting to have another power that is not God's power. You want to control things through spells and all those things. He said it's witchcraft if we are willfully rebellious against his word. And he says in verse 23, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry, stubbornness, which is basically, in the Hebrew, the same meaning, I'm rebelling. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what they say. That's stubbornness. We've seen it in kids, too. <laughs> seen it in adults, too. He says that's idolatry. And the interesting thing, this word for idolatry is the same is the word the Hebrew word that means your household God, not the God that was in the temple for the town, not the God at the city square that they had their own personal household God. He says when we're rebellious, when we're stubborn against God's word, it's like it's the same thing. You put a little God in your house and you worship it. You say what what can I do to please you? Because that's why people worship the gods. That's why they have their idols. You know that better than I again. They want protection. They want power. They want blessing. That's why the people of, in Canaan worshipped their gods. They wanted power. They wanted fertility. They wanted their crops to grow. They wanted to be protected. They were looking to someone besides their creator, their creator, to take care of them. So rebellion, sin is so much deeper than, oh, I, I did something bad. When we begin to understand how serious sin is, it helps us to say, God, help me. I do not want to. We're going to because we're, we're, we are in this flesh. 
but there's a difference between you you fall into sin, you 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 say something, you really say, oh, man, I didn't mean to say that. And I'm just going to hang on to this sin, and I like this sin. It's my little pet. And I'm going to feed it, and I'm going to hide it, and nobody knows. He says that's idolatry. What is idolatry? He says it's idolatry because we're putting something above God. God is the creator. That's why sin is so bad. I've been really thinking about this lately. God created you and I. He made us. He has a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for our lives. Before you were born, he had a purpose, a plan. And he made you a woman because he wants you to be a woman. He didn't make any mistakes. We're hearing that lie in our society. He made you a man because he wants you to be a man. It's not just a, well, let's just throw the dice and see what baby comes out. No, he planned for you to be a woman. He planned for you to be a man. And he planned for you to stay that way. Sin is against the Creator who made us. There's a verse in Isaiah, and it says, Can the potter say to the clay, What did you make? Can the potter say to the clay, You don't know what you're doing? That's what sin is, to say, God, you don't know what you're doing. I think I know it better. That's what Saul did. I know it better. I'm going to save the sheep, the best ones. I'm going to save the king. What an ego. What an ego trip. I'm going to save the king. He was the king of Israel. I'm going to save him. So he says sin is like, rebellion is like witchcraft. No, not like. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. That alone, I mean, I'm still chewing on that. Stubbornness is idolatry. And he says because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So what does it mean when we are willfully disobedient to God's word, God's written word? We're rejecting God. In the end, we're rejecting God. We're saying, no, I'm not going to let you be God in this area of my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. You'll understand. No, he won't. He's holy. He's righteous. He's pure. All of his laws, all of his commands are good. They're for life. And again, I'm going to repeat this because this is the most important part. Everything God has given us is so that we can have a relationship with him. Not a religion, a personal relationship. To know Christ, to love him, to have him work in our life, that he changes us more and more in his image. That's what it's all about. Relationship with the one who made us. The one who can satisfy, the one who can change us, the one who can heal us, the one who can comfort, the one who has everything we'll ever need. The one who loves you more than anybody else can love you, even the person that may love you the most on the earth, even if it's your mother or your dad or whoever, loves you more. And sin is what separates us. And he says, I don't want that. So repentance, Saul didn't repent. He said, I've sinned when he was confronted. You can read it in 1 Samuel 15. Again, next week I want to say more. He said, I've sinned, but he didn't repent. Repentance is not just saying, oh, I sinned. He didn't kill Agag. Samuel had to do that. If he had repented, he would have said, okay, I'm sorry, God. Here, let's kill all these sheep now. Let's kill Agag. No, he didn't do that. He didn't repent. He just felt bad he got caught. He felt bad that he had lost the kingdom. True repentance is, I see it's sin. It's, it's sin against God, our creator, the one who loves us. And I turn from it, and I ask forgiveness. Then what? That's where the blood of Jesus comes. That's where we bring our sin to the cross, and we say, Jesus, I can't change my heart. I want you to forgive me. I want to know you come into my life. We put our whole trust and our faith in him. And he helps us then. The things that may be difficult to leave behind, he changes our heart where we begin to say, I don't want that. That's not what I want. My heart has changed. He changes your want to.
So what are you going to do with this message? Oh, that's interesting. Interesting story. Good sermon, Pastor Sharon. <laughs> What did Saul do when God spoke to him? He didn't listen. He heard. But he did not do what God told him to. So, I started to say, if God is speaking to you, I think he speaks to us all through his word, including me. So what are you going to do? Are you going to say, okay, that was nice. Or are you going to say, God, help me. Get along with him. Say, Jesus, change my heart. If, if there's a sin in your life and you've been tolerating it, realize it's an idolatry against God. You're putting your will above his will. Say, God, I want to change the way I think about it. I want to cha change my heart. Sometimes we have to pray, change my heart. I've had to pray that. There's certain sins that were very difficult for me in my heart. And I had to pray, God, change my heart. And, and ask forgiveness and look at his word and begin to see through his eyes and he does it. If you will stay with it and ask, he will change your heart. Where There's even been a time where I prayed, God, I want to hate that. I want to hate it. And if you don't quit asking and you don't quit coming to Jesus and doing what he shows you to do, he will give you a hatred for those things that you once loved and thought, you could not live without. That sin you thought you could not live without when you're born again or when you can really repent, all of a sudden you will change your heart and you go, how did I ever do that? Lord, I can't believe that I wanted that. That's a new heart. That's, a, that's what Jesus does. Okay. It's all because he died on the cross and rose again. Hallelujah. Yes. That's liberty. Oh, my beloved, you're really free when you don't want to sin. When you really have repented, you don't want that thing anymore, that attitude, that word that you use, that thing that you do, whatever it is, whatever sin, whatever level it is. Real liberty is when we don't want it anymore, and that's what God does when we come with our whole heart and say, Forgive me. Lord, I see that it's wrong. And I want to change the way I think about it. And sometimes we have to renew our mind. He says renew your mind by the word of God. It's not always automatic, especially if you've been in something a long time, you've been tolerating a sin. It's, not, it's harder to get out of it than to get into it. But he is there to help. You can be free. And then you stop those things because, not because, well, I know I shouldn't, but I don't want to. And, and when you're filled with the Spirit, that's the other part. That's whole other sermon. He'll give you the strength. Don't tolerate. Seek Him with all your heart. Hear what God says. Romans says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. He's not standing there with a baseball bat. Repent. That's what Jesus got at the cross the baseball bat for our sins. He took that. God is standing there and saying, my goodness, I'm calling you to repent. I give you life. I give you strength. I give you everything to stay alive. Everything you have good is for me. It's my goodness that I'm calling you to repent. And woe, woe, woe to the person that says, I don't care. reject that kind of kindness and mercy and love because of what Jesus did on the cross. But his arms are open, there's time, and I just want to encourage us, what has God said to you? And I know that sometimes you're, you miss some things, but when you're home, think, what did God say to me? Is there some area? Come to him. There is nothing that he will not forgive when we repent. There's nothing he cannot forgive because of the blood of Jesus. There's nothing he cannot change if we'll walk with Christ and go his way. I'm going to repeat that. There is nothing. That's the word of God. He said if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. And it is a process. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, the Bible calls that 
sanctification, where he's changing us more and more into the likeness of Christ. It's a process, but we have our part. Father, I thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you that you want to have relationship with us more than we want it. That you want to have fellowship with us more than we want it. Lord, I pray for each one here and each one who will hear, Lord. God, open our eyes. I pray for obedient hearts that we see you, that we love you more, that we honor you more. Lord, I pray that you change hearts because you paid with your precious blood to forgive us, to cleanse us, to have us to be your children forever, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for your goodness today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take just a moment just to be still before God. I'm always still for God. Sign can rede mit ihm.